All right, thank you very much for coming. Uh, today, we've, uh, we're really lucky to have uh, uh, Kenneth Ruddinger uh, come here to talk about uh, quantum, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, quantum uh, computing verification and validation. Uh, Kenny is actually one of the, the experts uh, uh, in this field. He's uh, done a lot of extensions on, um, on um, gate set tomography and also has uh, developed an excellent library for doing this as well as randomized benchmarking and other tasks that are required for this. Um, some of the work that he's done that I, that I think is particularly impressive is he's done um, work showing that uh, in ion traps they're capable of performing gates below the threshold for the surface code for the first time in a rigorous fashion. Uh, and so uh, I'm really excited and looking forward to hearing what Kenny has to say about uh, where this field's going in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Um, really. Uh, very, very happy to be here. I'm really excited to, to talk with you about some of the work that I've done. Thank you all uh, for for coming to, to listen. And please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt with questions or comments. Um, I'm very interested to hear what, what uh, people have to say as well. So, um, just to get started, uh, so I want to talk about QCVV, and this is an acronym stands for Quantum Characterization, Verification, and Validation. And I'm going to spend the first portion of the talk discussing uh, what do we mean by QCVV? Uh, what, what good is it for? Why should we care about it? What are the things that we would like to be able to do with it? How can it help us achieve full-scale universal quantum computation? Um, then I want to talk a bit about how we've used QCVV techniques at Sandia, how we've developed certain QCVV tools there, and how we've used it to um, dramatically improve experimental uh, qubit implementations at Sandia. And then I just want to wrap up by discussing some future directions for QCVV, uh, some, some protocols that we've been developing at Sandia uh, more recently, uh, as well as some thoughts about where we think QCVV is going to be going over the next few years. So I want to start with a story from the future. Imagine that it is May 11th, 2029. And just in time for Richard Feynman's 111th birthday, you are all set to turn on the world's first full-scale universal quantum computer. Uh, and it will look, you know, something like this, of course. Uh, and so you, you turn it on, and you want to give it a, a simple question to start with. You say, computer, factor 42. This should be pretty easy, right? You say, OK, it's even. You divide by 2. You get 21. You run sure. Should be fine. The quantum computer thinks for a bit, and the quantum computer says, with infinite majesty, 42 is six nines. Wait a second. This doesn't seem right. Uh, I say, quantum computer, are you sure? Quantum computer says, yes, yes, I'm sure. It's, it's six and nine. And so you, you rerun the algorithm. You run it several times to check, and you see, indeed, every single time you get the same wrong answer. Um, hmm. This, this is not quite what you had hoped for. Uh, you check. You say, OK, maybe, maybe there was a bug in the software. Maybe, maybe we didn't implement Shore properly. So you go and you check the logical uh, code, the, the, the software at the logical level. And you see, indeed, no bugs. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. You say, OK, maybe, maybe we did our error correction wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with the instructions at the physical level. You check the software for the physical level for the, the error correction. And that also all checks out. So now you're sort of stuck. You have a quantum computer, but it doesn't work, and you don't know why. Uh oh. The problem is, at this point, should you find yourself in this situation, you have a device that's sufficiently complicated that you don't really know what to do to debug it. Uh, and so, in some sense, the whole point of QCVV is to prevent us from being in situations like this. Um, and so, so how do we hope to, to prevent things like this from happening? So, well, what do we mean when we talk about QCVV, right? So it's this acronym for Characterization, Verification, and Validation. Um, let's unpack this a little bit. So first, we have the notion of characterization. We want to answer questions like, what are my qubits doing? What are the gates on my quantum systems doing? So we answer these with, with uh, quantities like process matrices. Uh, and we have verification. This is, we want, to, we want to verify, are my qubits good enough to do things that I want to do, like quantum error correction? 
Uh, so you can you know, measure these things perhaps with things like fidelity for your process matrices. And then we have validation, and it sounds similar to verification. It's, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's essentially asking the question, are we asking the right questions with, with our verification questions? What are the metrics that actually matter? What are the things that we really care about to be able to do the things that we want to be able to do? So do we care about diamond norms or fidelities? Do we actually care about thresholds? Are there other things that we want to be measuring instead? Um, so so this, is, this is the basic idea. Uh, the point in some sense is that when you have qubits, there are going to be errors that you see with, uh, with the operations, with the, with the qubits themselves. Um, and you want to know what went wrong, why did, these, why did these operations not do what I wanted them to do, even if there are errors, though, is that OK? Can I still make do with the noisy gates, or do I have to fix them? If I have to fix them, how do I fix them? So in some sense, these are the questions that we're trying to answer with QCVV techniques. Uh, so you know, what is it that we really want to do with quantum computers? Well, we want to run circuits, right? So this is, of course, for the gate-based model of quantum computation. There are uh, other, other sorts of models as well, but um, we're going to be talking today in particular about uh, running circuits, although these comments more or less without loss of generality apply to, to other paradigms as well. So you want to run circuits, you know, things that look more or less like this. Uh, there are some problems, of course, or some, some, uh, some stumbling blocks that one has to, uh, has to overcome first. Quantum information is fragile. right? We know that quantum systems decohere very easily. It's very easy to lose quantum information. Uh, just because you know, your, your qubit interacts with the bath, a stray photon hits it, you name it. Uh, you look at it funny, you lose your quantum information. OK. Uh, you also want to be able to do operations on your quantum system. You want to be able to do coherent operations. Of course, these operations themselves are noisy. And in some sense, this is reasonably easy to see why this is. right? So suppose you have, for example, an ion qubit. And what are things that can mess up ion qubits? Light. How do you manipulate ion qubits? Light. So you, uh, you want to make sure that you know, you're using your lasers on your ion qubits, that you're using just the right light and not the wrong light. And of course, we know that, um, that you can't have uh, infinitely narrow bandwidth on your lasers. So there's going, going to be some fundamental uh, noise that you're going to encounter with, with these sorts of operations. OK? So, what do we want to do? We want to be able to perform quantum computation, perform coherent operations, but still protect the underlying quantum states that store the quantum information. Uh, and so in order to do this, we're probably going to use something like quantum error correction. There are, of course, some proposals that avoid using quantum error correction, but you know, we're pretty sure that we're going to use quantum error correction. Uh, if you're able to avoid using quantum error correction, that's great. But Either way, you're going to have to have extraordinarily low error rates, especially if you think you can actually avoid using quantum error correction. Um, and either way, you're going to have to have some notion of fault tolerance that you, you want to be able to achieve, to actually be able to do uh, error correction and then uh, full-scale quantum computation. So, so I've talked sort of in, in broad generalities about how quantum information is fragile and how things can go wrong. But more specifically, what are the things that could possibly go wrong with your quantum computer. So there are, I think, more or less, broadly speaking, three kinds of errors that you can encounter. You can encounter coherent errors, unitary errors. You want to do a T gate, but instead you do the rotation with uh, an extra pi over 16 rotation. Or maybe you don't do uh, an X rotation, it's an X plus epsilon Z rotation. Uh, so these are errors that are relatively easy to diagnose and relatively easy to fix. Um, going up in terms of things that can be a little bit, little bit harder to, to correct, we have stochastic errors. right? Um, just because we know that there's going to be interaction with a bath, you're always going to have things like amplitude damping or T1 processes. You have thermal relaxation. You'll have things like dephasing T2 processes. Uh, these are things that you can engineer your quantum systems to, uh, to have Long T1 times, long T2 times, so you have you know, minimized the stochastic error. But these are still going to be some fundamental issues that you're going to, to encounter with your system. Uh, and then there's everything else. 
what I call non-Markovian noise, although I will note that this is sort of an overloaded term, so I want to be clear what I mean by this. I mean specifically things that you cannot represent as completely positive trace preserving maps on your quantum system of the fixed dimension that you want them to be that are static in time. Like I said, everything else. So uh, what, are, what are sorts of things like that that you, you, we might find? Um, you might find that there's time dependence. Maybe there's a drifting electric field or uh, a magnetic field that drifts in your lab. So your, your uh, gate now is not the same as the gate that you have in five minutes. Or maybe you let a theorist like me into the lab and I bump the table. And all of a sudden you see a big shift in your qubit frequency. Okay. Um, there can be context dependence. This can mean a variety of different things, but one way to think about a certain example of context dependence is say, a gate that I perform after a different gate is different than if I didn't perform the previous gate. So a C naught now is different than a C naught if I performed a T gate before the C naught, for example. Um, you can have leakage. Uh, you can, that is, say, you, you can go outside your two-level system. You can go to some higher-lying state or some state uh, adjacent to, to the qubit subspace. This is something that, in particular, we know uh, can happen in things like superconducting architectures, where the two qubit uh, interactions are frequently uh, mediated by going through a higher-lying state, and then you depopulate that state to go back to the qubit subspace. Uh, if you don't completely depopulate the third state, then you have leakage. Uh, there can be crosstalk. If I have a qubit over here that I'm idling and a qubit over here that I'm driving with, um, with X gates, it's possible that I accidentally drive some X rotations over here. Or maybe I somehow entangle the two. Um, and, of course, plenty more. Uh, so there are all sorts of things that can go wrong with your, with your qubits, and of course, uh, further complicating the matter, the number of parameters that you want to write down to describe your system grows exponentially with qubit number. And that's true even just for these first two types of errors, right? It gets even worse if you want to include all sorts of non-Markovian dynamics. Um, so, so we want to be able to somehow, somehow characterize these, uh, these kinds of errors so we can fix them, so we can uh, have have fault-tolerant quantum computation. And of course, the other thing to, to point out is that when we consider all these non-Markovian kinds of errors, these are things that threshold theorems essentially say nothing about, right? We're typically assuming that uh, the kinds of errors we have um, are uncorrelated in space, they're uncorrelated in time, they're restricted still to the qubit subspace. Um, so now all of a sudden you start throwing these kinds of errors in and it gets, it gets much worse, it becomes much more problematic. So, Broadly speaking, what do I think that QCVV should offer? I think there are more or less two different kinds of things that we should want from, from QCVV techniques. First is a framework for describing and quantifying errors. Uh, we want to be able to somehow quantitatively describe quantum processes. So typically, we think about uh, things like process matrices, which are very useful for describing quantum processes, uh, provided, of course, they don't have to capture non-Markovian dynamics. Um, given a particular uh, mathematical description, you want to come up with reasonable metrics to compute. So you can say, this gate is better than that gate. So do this gate. Um, or make this gate even better so we can actually achieve something like a fault tolerance threshold. And it's important for this framework, I think, to be architecture agnostic. That is to say, you want to be able to have tools uh, that can describe in a unified language uh, superconducting qubits and ion qubits and semiconductor qubits, you name it, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, you want to be able to make cross-platform comparisons. And this isn't so that you can say, oh, well, my qubit's better than your qubit. It's so that you can have an understanding as to whether or not the particular architecture you're pursuing, uh, if it even makes any sense, right? You say um, that, that the kinds of error rates that we can achieve with this qubit technology, uh, if you know that, that you can't ever possibly hope to get the same kind of error rates for some other technology, then you know, maybe you want to rethink the architectures that you're exploring. You also want to be able to learn from and inform other architectures, 
right? So obviously, yes, the physical operations that you perform on the different systems are going to be different, but there's still a lot to be learned from the different systems that, that are uh, applicable across the architecture. So for example, uh, if you want to reduce uh, the impact of quasi-static noise, we've learned that things like uh, dynamically corrected gates are very useful. And it turns out that that's going to be true across different architectures, even if the details of those the DCG sequences that you run may or may not be different. Um, but the point is, you know, you run some particular protocol, you see how it improves your metric, and say, ah, I bet that this will work in another platform as well. And you can try that and, and, um, and, and learn more about the system and learn more about quantum information processors in general by being able to do these sorts of things. Uh, so in some sense, this is, this is the descriptive task that QCVV, I think, can offer. And there's a prescriptive one as well. That is to say, the protocols for diagnosing and correcting error. They say not just this is what your qubits are doing, but here's a way that you can figure out what your qubits are doing. Here's a way that you can figure out how to make your qubits better. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of different protocols, um, just to name a few. So randomized benchmarking is one. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different flavors of phase estimation. Uh, there's gates at tomography. I've bolded gates at tomography because that's one that I'm going to spend a reasonable portion of the talk discussing. Uh, this is, of course, a non-exhaustive list. There are plenty of other things that um, you can do as well. So before we uh, start talking about gates at tomography, uh, I want to talk a little bit about mathematical descriptions of quantum processes. So the uh, so so I said that. Um, you know, if we really want to have a full description, we want to be able to somehow capture non-Markovian dynamics. Uh, we don't have full descriptions yet, so we're just going to go with the Markovian picture for now. Uh, and to do this, we use what's called the Liouville representation, also called uh, Hilbert-Schmidt space. The, the, the basic idea is that you can take a density matrix in the basis of Pauli matrices, so something, you know, just a single qubit density matrix looks something like this, and we're going to vectorize it in a particular fashion. We're going to represent it like this, and similarly, we can take uh, effects from uh, measurements and look like this. And what's nice about this picture then is any Markovian process that can act on the state, you can write down as a matrix that looks like this. And then if you want to compose um, uh, quantum processes, you just multiply the process matrices or sometimes referred to as the super operators, you multiply them together. And they have some nice structure too. So you'll note that the first row is just one followed by all zeros, indicating that your map is trace preserving. You have this three by three subblock of lambdas. This is the unital subblock. So this captures all unitary dynamics as well as any sort of decoherence phenomenon that is not amplitude damping. If you've got some amplitude damping phenomenon, then that gets captured by, uh, by these taus, this, this column vector over here. And then if I want to know, given a particular input state, given a quantum circuit specified by uh, some, some gates, and then a, uh, an outcome effect, I want to what's the probability of seeing this uh, outcome. You just get it through matrix multiplication. You just get essentially it's a weighted inner product. Uh, so then if I want to actually go and run some sort of QCVV protocol, in general, they're going to be specified as quantum circuits. The idea is you specify a collection of quantum circuits which specify a state preparation, some series of gate operations, and a measurement. You then get from this uh, collection, you, you repeat each of these sequences some number of times, you get frequencies which approximate the underlying probabilities for the different um, effects for the different uh, circuits that you, you've run. And you, you crunch some numbers using your favorite algorithm. Uh, and you come up with an estimate of the gate set, or maybe an estimate of some parameters that describe the gate set. So maybe something like the randomized benchmarking number. OK, but so the basic idea is I have sort of a nice black box picture here. I push a state preparation button. I push some, uh, some gate buttons. I push the measurement button. And then I get a, a light, a green light or a red light corresponding to the different possible outcomes. OK, and then you just do this a bunch of times to build up statistics. Uh, so why, you know, why would we want to do this? Why do we want to have actual characterization of the, of the gates, of the super operators? Well, 
So if we want to have quantum error correction, we want to be able to uh, satisfy some fault tolerance threshold, right? And so if we want to consider general errors, the threshold is specified in terms of a diamond norm, uh, and we want it to be below 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4. What is the diamond norm? This is essentially a measure of a worst case error rate. Basically, we're maximizing over all possible inputs, including inputs uh, on multiple qubits, uh, more than just what my gate is acting on. And then we look at the, the one norm. So essentially, we're looking at over all possible different measurements that we can perform. And we want to say, what's the worst possible performance that this gate could have over all possible inputs and all possible measurements? And of course, it sort of makes sense that we want to think about a worst case uh, metric because we want to consider the most possible general errors. Of course, when I say general, I still mean uh, things that are static in time, things that are, are Markovian. Okay, uh, you might ask, well, can I, can't I just, instead of using the diamond norm, something that's sort of conceptually a little bit more simple, something that's easier to measure, like infidelity or the RB number? Well, you could if you want to, but the problem is the bounds are kind of loose. Uh, the diamond norm in particular bounds the infidelity from below, from the, the, below the, uh, excuse me, uh, from below the, the, the square root of the infidelity. Uh, so if you want to confirm that you have a diamond norm error on the order of 10 to the minus 4, you would need to demonstrate an infidelity on the order of 10 to the minus 8. Uh, and that requires a lot of experimental resources. The best diamond, or excuse me, the best uh, RB infidelities that we've seen in any experimental systems are on the order of like 10 to the minus 6, and those are like real hero experiments. Oh, uh, yeah, so question. Are you feeling for how pessimistic that bound is? <sighs> you know, that's a good question. Um, so, so do you, do you mean uh, the the relationship between diamond norm and infidelity? Yeah, how pessimistic the right. square root of infidelity is in estimating the um, That's probably not super pessimistic, although that's something that we're we're still we're still thinking about. Sorry, is it, is it saturated as a constant factor of dimension or something like that? Yeah, there 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 is there is a, there is a dimensional factor. Yeah. Um, so, so what's the best but, example of like saturations as bound? some function of the dimension. So, so, I mean, the, the um, I'm, sorry, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I fully, I fully understand. Oh, well, I mean, so imagine, you know, this is a, say, a loose bound, right? But say, maybe there is a version of it when it's saturated, right? So there is an inequality for some, Example, but oh sure, yeah, yeah right. Off by some constant factor that is a function of dimension. So I'm asking, you know, do, do you remember by any chance what the, that constant factor looks like? Is oh, it, so so it's um, I believe that it's proportional to the dimension. Uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I believe that's right. But and cer certainly right, you you can saturate the bound if you have um, pure stochastic error, right? If you like like depolarizing noise, right? Um, is is when you sort of get get them as, as as close as possible, and then you get them as maximally far apart when you have uh, just pure unitary error. Is there another question? Uh, well, it was more just of a comment. Sure. So, um, David Poulet had been working a lot on uh, what types of norm are, are good for characterizing logical failure rates when you when you perform error correction, and from from my understanding, sometimes the diamond norm could be way off uh, by by several orders of magnitude if you if you want to use it to you know characterize the the particular logical failures, and it really also depends a lot on, on the on the noise model that's, that's being used. Sure. Okay. So make sure I understand what you're, what you're saying here properly. So if we're talking about logical error rates, um, that that doesn't terribly surprise me, right? Because we're just talking about the physical error rates of the physical qubits as opposed to the error rates on the logical qubits, okay. right? So that's sort of a, a, a different a different kind of quantity that we're measuring there, right? But but here, like you're you're using the diamond norm to kind of have a lower bound on what the, the threshold should be, right? So 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 okay. So so the the if 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 the observation is that when you have logical qubits uh, and you want to measure the logical error rates, that diamond norm is not appropriate. Right. Um, that that does not. I don't find that terribly surprising, right? Um, the question here. This is a little bit different. This is saying. What should the error rates be on the physical qubits to form up logical qubits that we can uh, correct with error correction? Yeah, uh, Go on. Another comment along this line, 
it's not that the bound is loose, it's just that we, uh, we care about diamond because the, the threshold is happened to be given by the diamond or bound. Well, sure, sure, but, 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 but if it were the case that we could say that, uh, that the bound between diamond norm and infidelity was, was linear, right, as opposed to, to quadratic, then we could go ahead and, you know, may, maybe just do RB and not have to worry about doing full gate characterization, right? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, well, all, all I'm saying is that the number 10 to the minus 8 is by no means pessimistic or shocking number, it's just a convention. Oh, sure, sure, no, of, of, of course, but, 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 then, but then the point is, if you want to experimentally get this kind of number, then the, um, directly through, you know, w without doing full tomography, doing something like RB, then all of a sudden this becomes um, very, very difficult. But, but that's, a, that's a, a calculation method dependent statement. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, yeah, uh, all I'm saying is that the naive number or the metric should depend on the, uh, uh, the purpose you, you should use. Sure. Not that the one, yeah, there's no the, the best Measure. Oh sure, right, 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 right. I'm, I'm not saying that this is that this is the best measure, right? The the point is that if you say so, given given this threshold, given that it's given in terms of a of a diamond norm, if you instead said I want to I want to get this with R B, right? I want to verify that my system is below this threshold using R B, then you would have to get an R B number that was about ten to the minus eight, and that is at this point experimentally inaccessible. It's something like the best that we've seen right now are about 10 to the minus 6. It's not never accessible, but it's something that just is, um, you know, still a ways away, still a ways off. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's oh, maybe we should take this offline and discuss, discuss more later. Um, so, right, so, 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 so the point is uh, if you want to actually, uh, in some sense, how do you want to? How, how would one go about demonstrating that you've satisfied this bound? So you could do something like RB, but there are some problems as we've, we've just discussed. Uh, you could instead do tomography on the gates, right? If you have actual tomographic reconstruction of the gates, then you can go and actually explicitly compute what the diamond norm is. So if we want to do tomography of some sort, um, what are the things that we want? We want it to be calibration free, and I'll explain what I mean more precisely by that in a moment, but basically what I mean is we need to not have a set of pre-calibrated input states and measurements uh, that standard tomographic protocols typically assume. We want it to be actually complete, right? It has to be tomographically complete. There are certain sorts of partial to tomographic protocols that people have proposed that can be very useful uh, and are cheaper than full tomography. Uh, but if it's not complete, you can't actually go and compute the diamond norm. We want it to be efficient, and I don't mean efficient in sort of the computer science theoretic sense in terms of being polynomial, but just in terms of being experimentally reasonable, something that uh, we could expect experimentalists to actually be able to do. Uh, and we also want it to be Markovian certifying. If I have a tomographic protocol and it tells me that my gates are very nice and says here, here are, here's the best fit to the data given our map, uh, given, given the map between the data and uh, the gate sets, and it says that we're below the fault tolerance threshold. Um, that's great, but how do I know that these, that my protocol, in some sense, isn't just lying to me, right? We want to make sure that the data that we have are fit by the estimate that we come up with. Um, and so, so we're going to see uh, over the next several slides uh, how we can come up with a, a a tomographic protocol that can satisfy all of these criteria. So. First, I want to talk a little bit about uh, standard tomography, right? So standard state and process tomography. So if you wanted to do standard state tomography, you do something like this. You say, okay, I've got an unknown state I want to characterize. You prepare the state, and then you do, say, a Z measurement. You do this a bunch of times. You build up good statistics. Then say, okay, I want to do a Y measurement. Well, you don't have a native Y measurement typically in physical systems. So what you do is you simulate it. You prepare your state. You apply some pre-calibrated gate, you do a measurement, build up good statistics. You do the same thing then for X. So you now have got X, Y, and Z um, measurements on your state. You can then reconstruct the state. Uh, the problem, of course, is that if you want to do this, you need to have pre-calibrated measurements and you need to have pre-calibrated gates. 
So how do you calibrate your gates? Well, you would do process tomography. And how does process tomography work? Well, you start with some pre-calibrated states, uh, and then you sandwich your unknown state, or excuse me, unknown map between your pre-calibrated state and pre-calibrated measurements, and you want to simulate various different input states, so you use more pre-calibrated gates, and you want to simulate various measurements, so you put in more pre-calibrated gates. Uh, and so, as you see, it's sort of circular. It's, it becomes process tomography all the way down. Uh, and so you can't, you know, really actually do this in practice in a way that uh, is calibration-free. So what do we want? We want some sort of calibration-free tomography. So to do this, we use something that we call gate set tomography. And this was an idea that was first introduced several years ago at IBM and something that we spent a lot of time working on to develop uh, at Sandia. Uh, and so, so the idea is what we want to do is we want to simultaneously characterize all of our gates and all of our input states and all of our measurements uh, in a way that then solves this self, the, the, the self-consistency problem, this calibration problem. And just a notational aside, so we're going to now start referring to uh, these state preparations as with this, uh, what we call a, a super cat. It's got an extra uh, angle bracket that indicates that this is a vector that lives in Hilbert-Schmidt space instead of Hilbert space. And then the dual to that is a super bra. And so then the point is that the probability for uh, witnessing a certain outcome given a quantum circuit is just given by this weighted inner product. So, uh, so if process tomography looks something like this, right? We have a variety of uh, known informationally complete input states and a variety of informationally complete and known uh, measurements. Instead, what we're going to do is something that looks very similar to it, but not quite the same. So we call this linear gate set tomography, or linear inversion gate set tomography. And the idea is that you form up a collection of informationally complete input states by choosing what we call fiducial gate sequences F from your set of gate operations that you can perform. You don't actually know what these are because you haven't tomographed them yet. Uh, but if you pick a sufficiently large set of gate operations to perform, to, to form your fiducials out of, uh, you can be reasonably sure that they're going to be informationally complete. That is to say, you're probing enough of the block sphere. And then we do the same thing for, uh, for the measurements, OK? And so, right, so the purpose of the fiducials is we want to make sure that the input states and the measurements are informationally complete without having done calibration. We're now going to perform two classes of experiments. Uh, the first look just like standard process tomography. The second, Look just like process tomography, except we took the process out. We're just essentially doing tomography on the on the fiducials. Okay, so you you run uh, you run these experiments. You get experimental frequencies that are approximately equal to the underlying probabilities for these different experiments, and then you run these through some pretty straightforward linear algebra, and you get uh, an estimate of your gate set. So you can you can write down explicitly. Uh, what your estimate of the uh, state preparation, the measurement effect, and the gates are. There is a cost, though, to giving up on having a pre-calibrated frame of reference. And sort of the way to, to see that is if we imagine that I take my gate set and I transform it by some invertible map B, so any invertible map, we call this a gauge transformation, I will now have a different gate set, right? It will be, the, as, as just an array of numbers, it's just a completely different array of numbers. But the problem is the predicted probabilities, the only experimentally accessible things that we can see, are still the same. So what this means is when I have a gauge freedom, when I have this, this particular gauge freedom, it means that I have an equivalence class on gate sets. So given a gate set, there's actually a whole equivalence class that are all physically equivalent to that underlying gate set. Um, now this all of a sudden sounds like this, this, this could be problematic, right? Because we said, well, what do we want to do? We want to be able to compute things like diamond norm. And diamond norm is very clearly not gauge invariant, right? If I change the gauge of the, the gate set, of the gate that I put in uh, to, to compute the diamond norm, the, the diamond norm can vary wildly. Uh, so, so what can we do about this? And is this really problematic? So, Fortunately, there's a pretty straightforward solution. All we have to do is 
optimize over the, uh, the gauge group to minimize uh, the distance between the target gate set and the gate set that we've reconstructed. And you might think, this, this sounds at least vaguely like we're cheating somehow, but we're really not because given that a gate set forms an equivalence class over all physically identical gate sets, I can just pick the one from that, uh, fr fr from the, the gauge fiber essentially, uh, to, to get the gate set that gives me the best score. Okay? Uh, so we've done this. Oh, sorry, is there a question? Good question. Sure. I mean, is it somewhat equivalent to basically saying, well, I'm going to optimize over choice what this actual measurement means, right? So, over basically saying, like, or what the state preparation means, right? So, saying, because, you know, normally in experiments, they'll say, well, I'm actually doing here a measurement along the axis, right? And right. your approach is saying, well, I'm actually going to compute that for, for my purposes, if I'm trying to do this thing that I'm going to be close and I'm going to actually this should be interpreted as a measurement along, you know, z plus 0.1x. Sure. Sure. Um, that, that, that's a good example, but it, it's a little bit broader than that too, right? Because we can also be doing um, sort of non-orthogonal transformations as well, right? But, 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 but absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so we sort of understand what it means to compute in polyframes, which is mm -hmm. more or less what B is doing to us. I say more or less. It's sure, less, right. less general than that. But one could imagine the following. Suppose you had gate transformations applied at different points in the computation that could make segments of the computation better in that gauge and optimize that. That is, let B be B sub I. Mm -hmm. So, so if, you, if you did that, um, then, then this, this, wouldn't, um, this wouldn't in general necessarily this, I don't think this would preserve the, the underlying probabilities, right? The, the physically observable probabilities at the end, because you need to be able to stitch together, right? It, it has to be the case that when I multiply g1 by g2, if I then, you know, subject g1 to, you know, some, so it's got b, g1, b inverse, then I've got g2 and it's a b, g1, b inverse, those b's cancel. So if I change the b's, those aren't going to cancel anymore. No, that's right. You have to change the computation as well, obviously. I'm, I'm talking about constructively changing the computation based on your tomography to decide which poly basis to compute in and make it so. Assuming the polys may be your least error-prone problem, but I don't know. Hmm. That's it's an interesting, a, interesting thought. It's an to, optimization strategy. Sure, I have to think about that. So that's an interesting thought. It's an interesting way to think about it. Um, so... Right, so so we so we I have mean, gauge freedom, kind of. right, 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 right. So so we have this gauge freedom, but we we, we can deal with it. Um, we've gone and we we've done this uh, LGST procedure on uh, a trapped ion system at Sandia. It, it works, uh, but there are still some issues. Um, so even though it gives us full tomographic reconstruction module of the gauge, which we can take care of, and it's self consistent. The accuracy is limited by one over the square root of the number of measurements that you've performed. It's a standard quantum limit scaling. Uh, and if we want to get down to something like 10 to the minus 4 in diamond norm, then we're all of a sudden looking at something like, you know, order 10 to the 8 uh, experiments or experimental repetitions. So can we do something better than this? Can we, for example, you know, reach the Heisenberg limit? It turns out that we can improve the accuracy scaling. And the way that we do this is we use long sequences that consist of short, repeated sequences. And so to illustrate sort of how this works, let's start with a, a little toy example. Imagine that you've got a gate that is some very small sigma z rotation, okay? And your task is to determine that this operation is different from the identity. Well, what you can do is you can prepare your state, perform the gate, and then do a measurement. And if you do this, you need to repeat this process on the order of 1 over theta squared times in order to distinguish from the identity. Alternatively, you can push your gate L times so that you've brought your state vector all the way around to the opposite side of the block sphere. And now with only 
one order one measurement, you can distinguish this from the identity. What have we done here? We've amplified coherent errors through repetition. So this is to say, right, we can measure with accuracy plus minus theta, either repeating the gate order one times and then performing one over theta squared measurements, rep repetitions of, of this experiment, or we apply the gate order one over theta times and then we need only order one repetition of the experiment to distinguish it from the identity. Now, of course, you might say, wait a second, that seems, that seems neat, but I feel like you're cheating again because how do you know what L is supposed to be if you don't know what theta is? Uh, this is a very reasonable objection, and in, in point of fact, what we wind up having to do, because we don't know what theta is in advance, we proceed iteratively. So you do this experiment for L equals 1, for L equals 2, 4, 8, and so on. Uh, so you can sort of bootstrap your way along, making sure that you don't take essentially the, the wrong route uh, of, of the polynomial. You, you, don't, you don't get uh, an extraneous route. Um, and this way we can you know, figure out what the phase is. And this is very similar to certain phase estimation protocols. Uh, so you might ask then, well, if this works to amplify the errors, um, can we just make all of our experiments consist of doing this for the different gates? Just take a gate and repeat it more and more times. And then that just be the collection of experiments that we want to perform. So this is a good start, but it's not complete. Uh, what we would have to do as well is we, we need some other sequences to, to be sensitive to other kinds of errors. So for example, if I have tilt error that I want to uh, amplify, uh, if I just repeat the gate uh, a bunch of times with the tilt error, eventually I will echo out the tilt error that's present. So we need to somehow catalyze those errors, turn the tilt errors into phase errors. So then you do uh, uh, sequences like gx, gy, for example, an x pi over 2 rotation, then y pi over 2 rotation, then repeat that, repeat it four times, etc. cetera. Uh, so the idea is that we, we want to perform these kinds of experiments to get what we call long sequence GST. So what we want to do is we want to be able to amplify all the possible errors that we can witness in a gate set. And we repeat not just the individual bare gates themselves, but collections of short sequences we call each individual short sequence a germ, and the idea is we want a, an, a, a complete set of germs so that we can amplify all of the errors in the gate set. And I'm not going to go into the details as to how you select the germs, but there's a pretty straightforward way to do it to make sure that you are sensitive to all, all of the, the error parameters in the gate set. And then what you do is you perform experiments that look like this. You start with a state preparation, you have your input fiducial, you take your germ, you repeat it some number of times, and then you have some measurement with some measurement fiducial, okay? And you get frequency estimates for these different uh, weighted inner products. And then given an estimate of the gate set, what you can do is you can compute a log likelihood or a chi-squared score. And uh, what you want to do is you want to find the gate set estimate that either maximizes the log likelihood or minimizes the chi-squared, okay? Um, and so you, you, you can do this, use numerical optimization techniques to estimate the, uh, the gate set uh, such that you've minimized chi-squared or, or maximized log L. Uh, of course, in the same way that you can't just skip to the end with the, the toy example I showed by just repeating the gate one over theta times to begin with, you need to proceed iteratively. So you start by uh, performing just LGST to get an initial estimate of the gate set, then you perform your experiments where you uh, repeat your germs once, you come up with an estimate for your gate set uh, based on that data, you then go to the next uh, generation where you repeat the gates, the germs twice, then four times, and so on, until you come up with a final GST estimate. And so why do we do this iteratively? This is essentially, uh, we want to you know, avoid the wrong branch of the solution. Uh, and just one brief technical point, for numerical stability reasons, we wind up minimizing the chi-squared value uh, for all of the initial, or all, all, all but the last uh, generation of data on the last generation, we maximize the log likelihood. So how does this actually wind up performing? So we'll look at some simulated long sequence GST uh, analysis on, or so we simulated data on an identity x pi over 2, y pi over 2 gate set with some small unitary error. And what is the 
what's the error of the estimate, how's its scale. So if we look at the diamond norm in measuring the error of the estimate, it goes as one over the maximum sequence length. That is to say, we're Heisenberg limited, as are the error bars for this protocol. Um, this is, of course, all well and good on a laptop. How does it actually perform in the lab? Well, there are a couple things that we might want to be a little wary of. For one thing, we can't compare to the true gates, right? So I can't actually hope to get a plot like this insofar as I can't compare my estimate to what the actual underlying gate is. Uh, also, what happens if the errors are non-Markovian? Because I simulated the data, I know that the errors that I put in were Markovian, right? Uh, so fortunately, there are, uh, we, we don't have to worry too much because we can still compute reliable error bars. So if the error bars are really big, then we know that we, we don't need to, we oughtn't trust the, the estimate that much. Uh, and we can also quantify the non-Markovianity basically by seeing how well our estimate fits the data that generated that estimate. Uh, so to look sort of pictorially how we might represent uh, scoring the non-Markovianity, I have just a ni nice little graphical representation where we have uh, on the x-axis we're going to uh, plot length of the gate string, and on the y-axis we're going to have the different germs. And what we're going to do is we're going to put each individual sequence, uh, each individual gate string or uh, quantum <coughs> circuit, we're going to assign a little box to, all right? And so, so each of these boxes we can break down into a, another six by six grid of boxes corresponding to the six input fiducial states and the six measurement fiducials that we, we perform. Uh, and um, if we fit that, uh, that gate sequence, that, that, that experimental gate sequence data well with our estimate, we'll color it blue. And if we don't fit it well, we'll color it red. So let's look at some simulated data. We get lots and lots of blue, a little bit of red. Right? And why do, we, why do we get red? Well, we expect that these scores here, we expect the chi-squared scores, the log likelihood scores, to be chi-squared distributed. And so if the null hypothesis is true, then we should uh, see some small number of, of uh, bad scores and otherwise uh, see, see good scores. Uh, if the null hypothesis is not true, we have an experimental data set here, we get a lot of red. So we can fit the data all right, particularly at, at, at low uh, sequence length, small sequences, but as the sequences get longer, we do a worse and worse job of fitting the data. Even though we're looking at the best fit to the data given the model, the model isn't very good. Okay, so what were the things that we wanted in our tomographic protocol, we want it to be calibration free, we want it to be complete, we want it to be efficient, and we want it to be able to certify. All right, you have a question. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, Why would identity, long identities, be significantly worse than applying an actually active gate? That's an excellent question, and it turns out that it depends on the details of the identity operation that you're doing, and we're going to come back to this point in a few slides. So, very, very, very good, very good. Uh, observation. Uh, so what do we actually do with this tomographic protocol that satisfies the various criteria that we wanted? Well, we're going to try to use it to fix experimental qubits. And so this is what we did at Sandia. So over the course of about a year, we used GST to characterize and improve a single trapped 171 ytterbium plus ion qubit. And as you'll see in a moment, the first iteration was extremely noisy, very non-Markovian, and by the end of the year, we were able to certify that the uh, qubit behavior was uh, very close to Markovian on sequences out of out to length 8192, and it produced a gate set that we were able to certify to be below the threshold for fault tolerance. So here is the abbreviated story. So we start off with a data set that we try to fit uh, with GST, and we get lots and lots and lots of red. So here we've aggregated the six by six grid into just into single blocks, um, and you'll see it's lots and lots of red. And so this tells us that there's lots of drift going on. There, you know, so, so somehow, somehow we don't have a very stable qubit. So the first thing that we did to fix this was we introduced BB1 pulses, dynamically corrected gate sequences to make the gates more stable. Took more data, and we get much bluer scores. Still not perfect, still, still have a lot of, of red, still a lot of model violation. Um, so 
What we then did is we uh, introduced some more drift control on the electronics. Um, and we also realized that we weren't using a full set of germs. Uh, so we, we expanded our, our germ set to be uh, complete on all the, the gate set parameters and ran GST again. Well, it still doesn't look great, right? We still, still have a lot of red. But there's something interesting. If we, if we look closely here, we notice that the worst sequences are the ones that include the identity. Something is funny about the identity. Well, for the identity, what we were doing is we were just idling the system, just doing nothing for one, uh, one gate time. And I said, well, maybe, maybe we should try something a little bit different. Uh, let's do dynamical decoupling on the identity. And all of a sudden, it looks much more blue. It's much nicer. Uh, we still, still have a couple of squares that aren't perfect, uh, and those both include the identity. So let's, let's do uh, go to a higher order dynamical decoupling sequence for the identity and see what we get. So we do the further GI compensation, and we now go to a maximum L of 8,192. This is a total of 4,657 sequence, sequences with 50 clicks or repetitions per sequence for a total of 232,850 experimental repetitions. And so here's now the full data set for the final run, and it looks like this. So now we've gone and disaggregated the, uh, the boxes. Um, and we can see it looks very nice and very Markovian. So we certified here, the gates look pretty Markovian. Of course, what do the gates actually look like? Right? I've said nothing about what the gates are actually doing. So let's take a look at that. Here are the estimates of the process matrices. And if you take a look, uh, you don't need to look too closely, except I want to point out that any number that is close to 1 should be 1, any number that's close to minus 1 should be minus 1, and any number that's close to 0 should be 0. And you'll see that we are indeed pretty close on all counts. And here are the error bars. Uh, on a per element basis, we have error bars of about 10 to the minus 5. So it looks like they're really close. Of course, this doesn't actually tell you what the fidelities of the diamond norms are, though. So why don't we go compute what the diamond norms are? So we can do that, and we see that the diamond norm on each gate is below 10 to the minus 4. So we have certified that our gate set is below the diamond norm threshold for fault tolerance. We published this just a, just a few months ago in Nature Communications. Uh, so. What's the moral of the story? We were able to use GST to diagnose and correct stochastic error, unitary error, and non-Markovian error. You can see how these metrics evolved over time. Uh, so what do we want to do next? Well, there are a bunch of other QCVV protocols that we've developed, implemented, and tested at Sandia. I'm going to talk just briefly about a few of them. Uh, and one of the things that we've worked on is is 2 qubit GST. So here um, are some results, experimental results from uh, some, some collaborators of ours. Uh, and now here are the color box plots for their experiment. I've turned the box plot that we looked at earlier, I've turned it on its side because we got a lot of germs now. We got 70 germs. Okay, and we go out to here, this only goes out to a maximum length of. Um, Let's see, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Um, and uh, so, so we, we don't go too, too far. Um, and you'll notice there are lots and lots of experiments that you need to take. So 2 qubit GST is working, but there are plenty of things we want to do to improve it. Uh, we want to be able to reduce the number of sequences here, right? Because this is, this is a lot for an experimental group to, to go and, and have to gather. Um, it still takes a while to compute. Uh, when, when this was computed, uh, it took several hours to, to compute these estimates. Now we've got it down um, to order tens of minutes on a laptop. Uh, we'd still like to make it even faster, especially if we want to be able to do something for, you know, in real time to be fixing your gates. Um, 
We want to be able to improve the memory usage. You might be asking, where are the error bars on these estimates? Well, we don't have them yet uh, because of, of uh, memory constraints and trying to you know, work, work around those, those sorts of issues. But the bottom line is, this is looking very promising. Um, there are some additional two qubit GST improvements that we've made since this data was taken, which I've not mentioned here. Uh, but we think that full tolerance certification should ultimately be feasible for two qubit uh, gates as well. Another thing that we've worked on is robust phase estimation. Uh, this is a protocol that was developed by um, Shelby Kimmel, uh, Ted Yoder, and Guang Hao Lo at, um, at MIT a few years ago. And then working with uh, Shelby, we went and implemented, uh, we came up with a software implementation of robust phase estimation, and then went and ran it on an experimental system at Sandia. And so the idea is this is for diagnosing uh, and correcting coherent errors, particularly uh, rotation errors uh, or phase errors on your gates. Uh, you can think of the data that you take as being Robbie or Ramsey sequences, or plus plus. The idea is it's logarithmically spaced, and it's pretty straightforward uh, analysis of that data to then come up with estimates of the phase angles. And we found that we can estimate rotation angles to within four times 10 on the minus four radians with only 176 total experimental repetitions. So this is, this is very nice as well. And this was just published last month in PRL. Uh, we've developed some tools for context dependence detection. Uh, you might want to know, is my gate set at noon the same as it is three hours later? without having to run GST? Or is it the same if I have a light switch on in the other lab? Or whatever. You want to know, uh, are the gate sets taken, the gate sets under certain different experimental circumstances, are they the same gate set? Without having to actually go ahead and do a full gate set tomography analysis. And conveniently, this is very similar to comparing coin biases. What I mean by that is uh, each individual experiment that you perform, each individual gate sequence, uh, has some underlying probability uh, for a Bernoulli random variable, right? And they're basically like doing a coin toss. And so what we want to do is we want to say, given a particular gate sequence, in this context and in this other context, is the underlying uh, random variable, does, does it have the same weight or the same bias? Uh, and can we, can we figure that out with some sort of statistical significance? Well, in the, is there any statistical significance we can assign to our assessment? And there is. It's very straightforward to do. You just compute log likelihoods for the data um, uh, under the hypothesis that you have the same underlying uh, parameter and under the hypothesis that you don't. And you can compare them and come up with a score for that. It's just a few dozen lines of code to, to perform this test. You can run this on any data set, GST data set, an RB data set, you name it. Okay. Uh, and to give you a picture, sort of a sense of what the results look like, given um, the various log likelihood scores, you can go ahead and turn those into p-values. So we can look at a histogram of p-values for uh, simulated data where I just take a gate set, I simulate some data, I take that same gate set, I simulate some more data. So I've got two data sets generated by the same underlying physical gate set and compute the p-values for the different sequences that we see. This blue line is what we expect to see. And indeed, we see that everything matches up nicely. I can instead put some very small random rotations on the gate set and then run the experiment again. If I do that, and compute the p-values, we see significant model violation. It's very easy to detect, okay? Or very sensitive to, uh, to, to these relatively small changes. Uh, we've gone ahead and tested this experimentally uh, on a, a Qtrit system uh, at Sandia. And so now, again, simulation with, with no drift, with no change. That's, again, more or less what we expect to see. And then you look at what we have in the lab, and even though we don't see nearly as much model violations we saw on the previous slide, we still see some. So we can tell there has been some change uh, between the two different data sets that were taken uh, several hours apart. Uh, so the last thing that I'd like to talk about for just a minute is pigsty. This is 
Python gate set tomography implementation. This is our software suite that we've developed at Sandia. Uh, we've taken gate set tomography, we've put it in here. We've also now taken additional uh, QCVV protocols like randomized benchmarking, as well as these other tests that I just talked about. Um, it's, it's extensively documented. You can go and generate very thorough reports on, from GST data about your qubits. Can also give you more digestible smaller reports if you want. Um, and any experimentalist, if there should happen to be any here, they're welcome to use it. Uh, theorists are welcome to play with this too. It's very easy to use it to generate simulated Markovian data. If you have your own way method of generating simulated data, you're welcome to run it on that as well. Um, we would love to hear from you if you have any interesting observations about uh, behavior in the system, uh, in with, with with the software. You know, can you find uh, flaws with what we're doing? You know, find a physical model that we can't properly diagnose. We we would love to hear about that. So please, if you're interested, uh, email pigsty@sandia.gov or me. And so, uh, just to conclude, then we are developing and releasing and using QCVV protocols right now to make ever better qubits. There's still a lot of challenges that we want to, to tackle. We want to be able to deal with systems that have more than two qubits, right? Once we've got two qubits, that's nice, but we know that for universal quantum computation, we need a lot more than two qubits. Uh, so we're thinking about, you know, what, what are ways in which we can uh, analyze larger systems, especially because we know that we can't hope to possibly write down all the parameters for a gate set as soon as we get up to order just, you know, a handful of qubits, right? And we certainly can't make sense of what those parameters are either uh, in any sort of digestible, reasonable fashion. So one thing we've been thinking about, instead of uh, having full descriptions of the error processes, we instead try to verify error models and say, okay, you the experimentalist, tell us what do you think the kinds of errors are that your system can experience? What's a parameterized error model with a relatively small number of parameters that uh, you think could be messing up your system? And then we can run GST or something like GST on the system, try to fit the data to that model, and see if we do a good job of fitting the model. If we do a good job of fitting the model, we can say, hey, guess what? You've done a very good job of, uh, of guessing at what kind of error processes you're experiencing. Um, and if not, back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, what are, what are other things that could be going on? Um, and of course, there's still this issue of understanding what do all these numbers mean? And as we go to more and more qubits, we're gonna get more and more numbers. Uh, we are always looking for new collaborators to work with, also always looking for new platforms, new architectures to test our models, to test our methods on. And so with that, I would like to thank Robin bloom Cahote, Eric Nielsen, John Gamble, Peter Mounds, Jonathan Mizrahi, and Dan Lobster from Sandia National Laboratories, and Nathan Weeb from Microsoft, and also thanks to all of you for coming and listening. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a great talk, Kenny. Uh, so do we have any further questions? I have one question sure. regarding a two-qubit uh, mm -hmm. uh, GST. Uh, so is it... Uh, Using results from one qubit to GST, or is it just kind of start, starting from scratch with no upper knowledge of anything? So you can do sort of uh, disaggregated two qubit GST. So basically, two qubit GST now looks like uh, one qubit GST on this qubit, one qubit GST on this qubit, and then an additional set of experiments that together allow you to do two qubit GST. Okay. Um, but it's but, but the way that the optimization works, uh, you know, you're, you're still looking at all the data in total, but what you can do is you can take the two-qubit GST output and sort of, you know, more or less do a partial trace in some sense to say, okay, this is, this is what one qubit looks like, this is what one qubit looks like. Okay. Any further questions? All right, that, that case, I've got one. Sure. So... A while ago, I asked you a question about uh, about the robust phase estimation. Yes. In particular, the lower bound that's uh, known for the Halevo variance for phase estimation, which is pi over 2L, which was drawn above the line that you uh, you showed there. Uh, can you remind me what you know, the explanation for this apparent violation of the lower bound is? Uh, oh, point 0.2 here, sorry. Right, right, right. So, so, um... 
we are still puzzled by this one. Um, so the so so one one of the things um, so so I think I think one thing to keep in mind, right, is that um, we know that as we increase the number of repetitions of the experiments that we perform, uh, we can get increased accuracy, right? We're going to just keep shifting this line down until we wind up getting a sufficiently low error rate that we wind up getting onto the wrong branch, and then it flatlines, right? Um, so I don't think this really answers your question directly, uh, but I think, I, so, so, um, so with the whole level bound, how, how does that take into account the total, the total data acquisition rate? Does that... It, it, considers, it considers the, uh, the optimal processing of any data that you can end up getting, assuming a uniform prior for, uh, to begin with. Then it provides a, a, a bound on the best posterior variance that you can have in your estimate. Okay, so right. So I guess I would say, so we're, we're not... With the exception of the first generation of data, we're not assuming a uniform prior. Mm. Okay. Right. Then in that case, that can explain this. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Anything else? All right. Well, then let's make Kenny one last time.